All right, hello everybody. Sorry that I'm unable to be with you all today, but I'm recording this because I want to go over this tennis ball lab that you just did. At least I want to go over the last parts, like the calculations and stuff like that. Um, all the grades are in, right, in Genesis, so everybody did fine on this, but I do just want to go over to, to uh, so that you can see exactly how it's done, and then you can compare it to how you did it. So please work through this, and please review it, and make sure that um, you know how to do it correctly. You know, again, grades are already in. If you didn't do it exactly right first time around, not such a big deal. So starting with this first part. The approximate height of the wall is 11.25 meters, and we need to use kinematic equations to find out how fast the ball was initially moving when it was released. So here's your ball, all right, and you're throwing it up. And we want to find that VI right here based on the fact that it would have gone to the top of the wall, which was 11.25 meters. So needless to say, 11.25 meters is one of the things that we know in this. Uh, in this problem. And 11.25 meters, I'm going to label that as our delta x, because that is the total displacement that your ball would have done after it was released, and then going all the way up to the top of the wall. And then we also know that the final velocity of the ball would be 0 meters per second right up here at the max heights. So at the max heights, we have a velocity of 0 meters per second. And I'm labeling that as VF. We know that it's 0 because as it goes up, right before it comes back down and it changes direction, there has to be one split second there when the ball actually is not moving and its velocity is 0. That has to happen in order for its velocity to change direction and for it to come back down. So I'm going to label the VF as 0 meters per second. Now there's one more thing that we know that is not explicitly stated in this problem, but we also know that, again, for objects that are moving vertically, here on Earth at least, they feel the same acceleration. In fact, all of you in that room right now are feeling that same acceleration, except you're not falling because something's holding you up, whether it's a chair or the floor or you're standing on or whatever. And that is negative 10, right, approximately negative 10 meters per second squared. So my A, right, again, A in this case is little g, right, little g is the gravitational acceleration constant for Earth, and that is negative 10, so negative 10 meters per second squared. And what we're looking for is VI, right, this is what we do not know. So if you look at this, there is another thing that we do not know, although you could potentially find this thing by looking at your video, but there's no mention of time, right, I'm just writing this in red. But there's no mention of time. You could look at your video and kind of estimate the time, but you don't know exactly what it is. But that's okay, because we do have this nice kinematic equation here that doesn't use time. And if you write it all out, then you can see that we don't need it, and we have everything else that we need in order to solve for VI. Sorry, there's a really loud motorcycle right outside my window. I'm not sure if you can hear that. But anyway. Um... So if you look at this, we can easily solve for VI. The VF is just zero, so I can just get rid of this, right, and label it as zero. There's no point in leaving that VF squared in this case. So that means that I'm going to subtract this 2A delta X. This is all multiplied together. Right? So since it's all multiplied, it's all one thing that I'm going to subtract. So I'm going to subtract this to the other side. Hopefully this all is pretty clear from your algebra. So then I get negative 2a delta x equals vi squared. And we have this negative 2 here. I mean, I'm sorry, we have this negative in front of the 2 here. But that's going to be fine because our acceleration is negative 10, right? So when I plug in negative 10 for that a, then I'm going to get a positive number. If you square root in this class and you get a negative number under the square root, right? So you get an i. See, if, I, if this 10 is not negative, then we would be square rooting a negative number and getting that imaginary number, right, i. That would mean that you would have done something wrong. We're never going to do imaginary numbers in this class. You are never going to take the square roots of a negative number. So if at some point you're square rooting a negative number, then you messed up somewhere along the way. It's actually a good clue for you to then to look back and check your work if, you, if that happens. So we get negative 2 times negative 10 times 11.25, and this equals vi squared. Again, just don't lose track of what's what, right? So don't lose track of this square as you're doing your work. 
because we are going to need to square root eventually. But negative 2 times negative 10 times 11.25, that is just 225, equals vi squared. And now I just got to square root it, right? So I'm just going to square root and square root. And then we get 15. I don't know why I wrote the 5 first. We get 15 meters per second is our initial velocity. So pretty much everybody got that, which I was happy to see. I mean, I did go over it in class, right? But still, it's good that at least uh, all of you were pretty much able to do this on your own. Now, the next thing, right, which is for a wall that is double the height, right? How much faster would you have to toss the ball to have it reach the top of the wall that was twice as high? So here's our ball, and we're going up. But instead of 11.25, now we have double that. So 11.25 times 2, 22.5. That is the new height of the wall that the ball is going to be, or well, we should label that as the new displacement, right? That is the new displacement of the ball, according to this problem. So just because we're doubling the height, it doesn't necessarily mean that the velocity is going to have to be doubled. And I'm going to show you that in a second, but let's actually work through it. So same thing, right? We're going to write down things that we know and things that we don't know. So we know that our delta x is 22.5 meters. And we know that our a, again, is g, right? I just want you to keep track, know that that is little g. It is a number, it is a constant number, and that is negative 10 meters per second squared. And then our vf, once again, is going to be zero, because right at the top, that ball is not going to be moving for a split second. And once again, we're just solving for vi. So it is the same situation as the last thing that we did. But what's changed is this number here, right? This number is now different. We no longer have the 11.25. So if we go ahead and do the same thing, vf squared equals vi squared plus 2a delta x. This is once again 0. So I'm going to subtract my 2a delta x, subtract my 2a delta x. So then minus 2a delta x, once again, is equal to vi squared. Now, when I plug in here, negative 2 times negative 10 times 22.5 equals vi squared. Then I'm going to get, on this side, negative 2 times negative 10, right, 22.5, you should get 450 equals vi squared. Now if you square root this, square root of 450, it is not double of 15, right? So it's not going to be 30. If you do this and you check it yourself on your calculator, you will get 21 I say 21 and then I write 22. 21.21 meters per second equals vi. So why is it not doubled when we're just doubling the height? Well, the reason why is because of this square, right? Because of that square right in there. So if you double the other side, right, it doesn't double the side that is squared because the square is a different operation altogether, right? You're not just multiplying the vi times 2, because the vi is squared. If you were to do 30 squared, you would get 900, right? 33 times 3 is 9, and then with 30 would be 900, which is way more than, than the 450 that's here. Um, so no, if you double your displacement or you double a variable on this side of the equation, right, it would not mean that your velocity is doubled. You do need to go through and solve it again. Okay. So for the next thing, we need to figure out the time. Now we need to figure out the time for the same or the height of uh, the same wall from the previous question. So that would mean that our delta x is still 22.5. It says from the previous question, from the previous question would be a displacement of 22.5. And now we want the time. So, but be before I start labeling things that we don't know here, right? If we just go back. We did find the initial velocity that this would have to be moving at, which is 21.21. So that still holds true here, right? It is still a VI of 21.21. Because it's the same wall, you're doing the same thing, right? You're going from the bottom of it to the top. So your initial velocity is going to be the same that you just calculated, which is 21.21. The situation is the same. The gravity is, or I'm sorry, the acceleration is also still negative 10 right, meters per second squared. So you don't have to keep writing like A equals G, right, equals this, and 
you don't necessarily have to write like every single step that I write for your own work, like on a test or a quiz or for homework or whatever. But you do just need to show me something, right? You need to show me some idea of your work. You need to show me something about where you're getting your numbers from as opposed to just numbers. And I want to see what you're doing. But I definitely do put in a lot more detail in any of my lecture notes than is really necessary. But I'm doing that just so all of you can see all of it. I right? can see every aspect of it. So we have uh, all this stuff and we are solving for the time. The time is what we do not know. Now, one more thing I forgot to write in here, right, is that we still know VF is zero meters per second. So if you look at this, right, the delta X is 22.5, the VF is zero, VI is 21.21, .21, and then the G is negative 10. So we actually know a pretty good amount of stuff for this problem to solve the time. You could potentially, right, use this formula. XF equals XI plus VIT plus one half AT squared. That would get you the right answer. You would eventually get the time. But notice how there is a T and a T squared in here. So you're going to have to do some, fa uh, either some factoring or the quadratic uh, equation to find what the T is because of that square. Needless to say, that's a lot of work. Nobody wants to do that. So instead of doing that, let's use the simpler equation, which is VF equals VI plus AT. This equation works in this case. We have VF, we have VI, and we have A. So I just want to point that out because I'm really trying to emphasize that last step in the problem-solving skills that I showed you, where you want to choose the most efficient path or the most efficient method or equation that's going to get you to what you need. You don't want to do extra work than you have to. And in this case, using the position formula, the XF, that would be a lot of extra work. But we're not going to do that. So if we just use this equation, it just becomes VF minus VI over A. Hopefully you all see how I did that, right? I just subtract the VI and then I divide by the A. It's pretty simple algebra. The VF is just zero, right? So I could have just gotten rid of that before, but that becomes, if I plug in all this, right, this goes zero and then negative 21.21 .21, divided by negative 10 equals t. And that division is pretty easy, right? 21.21 21 .21 divided by 10, you don't even have to use a calculator for that. You just move the decimal over one place, or um, move the decimal back one place. So you would get 2.12 seconds equals your time. So hopefully that's not too bad, and it's all pretty simple now that I have this written out. Uh, a lot of people were able to do this right, and I hope that you're also starting to realize that really this stuff isn't that bad, right? It's really not that difficult as long as you're able to really just think through and think, okay, what do I know? What don't I know? What am I solving for? And what is the most direct way for me to figure that out? So let's keep going here and do the other parts. So the next part, the gravity of the moon is about one sixth the gravity of Earth. Knowing that Earth's gravitational acceleration is 10 meters per second squared, how fast would you have to throw the ball for it to reach the top of the school on the moon? So needless to say, this isn't something that you're going to have to do in real life, but I wanted to use this little bit of a creative problem here so that you could see what it's, how to solve something that's a little bit different from what you've seen, but still building on what you know how to do. All right, so in this case, what's changing is our acceleration, right? Because the gravity of the moon is not the same as the gravity on Earth. So let's write it like this. The gravity of the moon, right? So again, little g means gravitational acceleration. So the gravitational acceleration on the moon is equal to one sixth of the gravity of the gravitational acceleration on Earth. So as I've written this, right, I can put a little parentheses around here. That is literally what that part of the question is telling me, right? I am translating those words into this equation. That is what I have done. The gravitational acceleration on the moon equals one sixth of the, gravita uh, the gravitational acceleration on Earth. So, what this means is that this, this g, right, the g for Earth, goes into the numerator of this, and then it becomes g over six, right? This equals the gravitational acceleration on the moon. The g for Earth is 10, so 10 over six, the gravitational acceleration on the moon is about 1.67 meters per second squared. It's actually a little bit less than that, but not a big deal. Right? We're not going to worry too much about exactly what it is. 
but that makes sense because you should be using a much smaller number for your gravity gravitational acceleration on the moon since the moon is much smaller right so this is going to be our new a right this is our a so it equals negative 1.67 right because it's still going to be pulling the ball back down so a negative 1.67 that's our new acceleration now it says how fast would you have to throw the ball for it to reach the top of the school on the moon so the top of the school right that was the 11.25, right? That was the 11.25, not the 22.5. The 22.5 was double that. So, height of the school, which is what you did, right? That would be 11.25 for your delta x. Sorry, I wrote that kind of weird, but 11.25 for your delta x. Now, same deal where the vf is still going to be 0 meters per second. It's still going to reach a max height over here. And its V is still going to be 0 meters per second right before it comes back down. So, again, what we're solving for is VI. So I'm sure that you can see that this is starting to be pretty familiar at this point. We're going to use the same equation, right? VF, sorry, that's an F. VF squared equals VI squared plus 2A delta X. And same deal, right? This goes away. This is just 0. Subtract 2AX. So minus 2A delta X equals VI squared. And now the only thing that's a little bit different here is that I'm using a negative 1.67 instead of my negative 10. So negative 2 and negative 1.67. Still going here, 11.25 equals vi squared. So if you do negative 2 times negative 1.67 times 11.25, you should get 37.5 equals vi squared. Now you take the square root, square root. And then you should get 6.12 meters per second equals vi. That is how fast you would have to throw the ball um, initially for it to reach the same height that it did outside when you did it. So needless to say, it's a lot slower, right? It's significantly slower. It's way less than half of the velocity that you would have thrown it at. Okay, so again, hopefully that's not too bad. I know that the, the, that the acceleration and the gravity stuff is a little bit weird, but... That was kind of the point, right? The point was for you to think, okay, so what does that mean for my acceleration? Well, my acceleration is definitely changing. How can I figure out what it is, right? So I just wanted to wanted you to work with something that was a little bit different. I don't want you to just keep doing the same thing all the time. So for this last part, once again, we're just going to find the time, right? So how long is it going? How much time would it take for the ball to reach the top of the school on the moon? So our V right our vi we just found it is 6.12 meters per second and our vf is zero meters per second and then our a is negative 1.67 meters per second squared so again we know the delta x but we're not going to use that for this case because we're just looking for the time so the most straightforward thing is to do this right vf equals vi plus at now if i do this again i'm just going to make this zero right away so then we get, I move this uh, VI over, right? So and I'll just show you the algebra. So minus VI, right, over A equals T. All right, pretty straightforward. So then minus 6.12 divided by minus 1.67 equals T. So w one more thing, actually, I'll point out with these negatives, right? Your time is pretty much never going to be negative. Actually, I don't even know why I said pretty much. Your time will never be negative. Uh, in this class for any problem. So if you get a minus time for something, that's another indication that you've done something wrong. So if you're getting, if you're square rooting a negative number and you get i, right, lowercase i for imaginary, or you get a negative time for your answer or for any part of what you're doing, you've made a mistake somewhere. So in this case, my negatives all cancel out. So negative 6.12 divided by negative 1.67. This will give you a time of 3.67 seconds so there you go it might be kind of weird right that how can it be that our time on the moon is going to is going to take longer right that doesn't make any sense there's less gravity well again it's it's not just about the fact that the moon is smaller and the moon has less gravity the ball literally is moving slower right the ball literally is just moving slower on the moon so instead of it traveling 15 meters per second squared in the beginning, sure, it slows down, but it is moving 15, sec 15 meters per second in the beginning. It's only moving 6.1. So it's significantly slower. 
And I mean, look, if you think about videos and stuff like that of astronauts on the moon or astronauts like in space, right, uh, space station or whatever, they're moving really slowly. And it's easier for them to move around because there's less gravity, but they're not moving fast. It's all very slow. It's all very floaty, right? This is why it's a real thing. It takes more time to move the same distance because you're just moving slower. It's just the way it is. Okay, so these last two questions here, I'll be honest, look, there wasn't really a right answer for these, right? These were more just kind of two fun questions for you to kind of think about. Um, and I wanted to see what kind of like creative answers uh, all of you would come up with if you want my personal answer right so if you if we are shrunken down to the size of a nucleus right and we are placed on top of the tennis ball again that is roughly the ratio of size of you right now to the earth around you roughly it's actually n not quite the same the um the the atom nucleus is actually slightly smaller by comparison to the tennis ball but whatever so would you notice it moving if it was tossed in the exact same way well I did put in that little hint there about the ratio of your size to the size of the earth because think about it. Do you notice right now or any, at any point that the earth is moving? Do you notice that it's spinning on its axis? Do you notice that it is orbiting around the sun? I mean, no. no you, I mean, you know that's happening, but you don't feel it, right? You don't see it happening. But in reality, the Earth is moving absurdly fast. I don't remember the orbit speed off the top of my head, but if you're curious and you want to check it out, the Earth both spins insanely fast and it orbits around the sun insanely fast. Um, and we don't notice it. So I would think, at least I would imagine, that if we were that small, we would not notice the tennis ball moving because the reference, we would just have no reference for it moving because we would just be too small. And then the second thing, right, if you're in outer space and you're large enough to fit the Earth in the palm of your hand and you toss it up, would it come back to you? Why or why not? Again, this isn't a serious question, but um, if, if you think about that, right, so uh, obviously if, if you toss the Earth then and you're, you're bigger than the Earth, then you're not throwing something on Earth, so the Earth's gravity is not going to pull itself back right it's not going to like pull on itself and pull it back um the same way that every object here on the planet does get pulled back down right but you're huge in this in this scenario right you are massive um you're actually about the size of the sun the sun's actually a little bit bigger than that so if you were big enough to put the palm, the earth in the palm of your hand that's still not as big you would still not be as big as the sun um but you're you're pretty close but the sun has its own gravitational pull, right? So does everything in space. So if you're really freaking big, you're going to have a huge gravitational pull um, going towards you because you're going to be deforming space all around you. And if that Earth is right next to you and you go to throw it away, it's going to come right back down because space is curved all around you and it's just going to fall right back into you. At least... I think that would happen. And that that's what would happen, right? And I mean, it kind of makes sense if you think about the stuff that is not science fiction and not made up, and uh, put it in this made up scenario. So anyway, not such a big deal. Those those two questions were more for fun anyway. So what I would like for you to do now, now that we've finished going through these example or these uh these parts of the lab where you had to do all this calculating stuff. Um, there are some practice problems for you to do on Schoology in the same folder that you access this video. And I want you to keep in mind these, right? These problem solving techniques that I showed you all. Um, again, these, I want you to really get the hang of using these techniques because they're what's going to allow you to tackle any problem regardless what it looks like. There, you can't uh, problem solve by just memorizing stuff that you've done before because in physics you can't really do that either because problems are unique right there are each problem may be similar but they are unique in their own way but really outside of this class outside of physics class every problem that you're going to face is going to be something different right every problem that you face whatever in whatever you do is going to be something unique and if you're just memorizing what you've done before it may help you, but in order to really solve the problems, whatever it is, this is the stuff that you really got to learn how to be able to do. So focus on these things, right? These five things that we've gone over as you go through those problems. And I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good day, everyone.